My name is Warren Paul Anderson. I'm uh, on the product team at Spring. I joined Ripple three years ago. Uh, work, I started working on the XRP core protocol, XRP Ledger, um, and then created the uh, XRapid product and uh, recently joined Spring. Uh, before uh, my, my days at Ripple, I was uh, in the Bitcoin space, created a Bitcoin startup in 2013, doing uh, Bitcoin derivatives using smart contracts, a Bitcoin script. Don't ask me how that experience was. It was not fun. <laughs> um, so uh, kind of, I come from a product perspective. So I'm always thinking about like, how do we really define the problem? How do we kind of sift through some of the use cases? A lot of the work I do isn't very flashy. It's kind of just kind of how do we solve problems? How do we come up with like solutions to these problems to actually, you know, make some something valuable and, and be really good at it. Um, and at Ripple, we actually, oh, and apologies for the cruddy uh, images because I was literally piecing these slides together at last minute. So at Ripple, we think a lot about liquidity. Uh, that's a very packed word and, and pretty much like 98% of Wall Street is, is in you know, solving liquidity challenges. I think that uh, in the, especially in the crypto space, there isn't a lot of focus on, on liquidity and just how hard it is to actually solve for liquidity. So I think right now, the kind of the state of, of, of ILP, and um, Evan get a, gave a great presentation about it, but it really kind of state of ILP is, is it comes down to kind of, there's a, there's a lack of liquidity on the network. And there's a lot of ways that you can attack that. Um, and we, we, again, we think about this a lot at Ripple. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, it's, it's pretty simple but sometimes it can really feel like getting blasted in the face with a fire hose. And then we're kind of left like, what, what just happened? Uh, we ran a lot of like market maker programs and, 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 uh, and experiments on, on different markets. And you know, we've learned a lot of lessons and we've kind of come up with this thing that we call like a liquidity flywheel. And I kind of tried to adapt it to, to Interledger and uh, this is something you, you would probably recognize. A lot of companies that have like two-sided, kind of a two-sided marketplace have this kind of type of flywheel where you have demand and when you, you start with demand and that increases utilization on the network, which at some point, you know, someone can make money because there's utilization and that, that uh, those earnings turn into actual like more availability. People want to make more money which drives more demand. And this is actually not a wheel, it's a, it's a square, so it's a pretty crappy flywheel, but uh, I'm not a designer. Uh, so how we're kind of focusing on this, like, and looking at this on the, uh, on the spring team, is how to, what, are, what, what can we do to increase availability and drive utilization? We've got a lot of kind of approaches on how to do this, but I wanted to talk kind of a little bit more about you know, the actual, uh, the use cases and, and, and then we can uh, get into this maybe in conversation a little bit. So there's a, there's a, uh, a common theme, especially in the crypto space to like shiny object syndrome. Uh, you know, we always want to like build for like the future of like, you know, machine to machine payments and like all this stuff. And like my grandma's like, what does that mean? I don't care. Um, so I think in order for a network to grow and really to kind of add value we have to kind of get um we've got to get a little boring so like when i was a kid you know i always wanted to go out and play and like do fun stuff play video games but my parents are always like do your homework first i'm sure this is a common thing you've heard before um and like you have to do your homework first in order to actually have fun and like like do the fun stuff so i think you know a lot of people in this room like you know we still have homework to do. We still have a lot of like core things to build. We still have a lot of like kind of really core stuff. And some of it can be boring, you know, but, but that's okay because we got to do the homework first in order to actually achieve what we want to build in, in the future. And that means getting a little basic. And that's, that's actually okay. Um, so the rest of this presentation is going to be pretty basic. There's going to be no surprises. A lot of stuff is going to be like, I've seen this before, I get it, I get it, but I just want to drive it home and, and really talk about it. So one of the spaces that, that the Spring team particularly is looking at is peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments. If anyone's not heard of peer-to-peer -peer payments, you're probably at the wrong place. 
So there's a problem, and, and Evan really kind of uh, highlighted it very succinctly. It's, you know, payment networks are really siloed today, and they're becoming more and more siloed. They require users to join the same network in order to send each other payments. So this is the case of, like, payment applications. This is the case of, of crypto networks. Uh, this is the case of banks. This is just, like, ledgers everywhere, right, and, and really no actual interoperability protocol, which is, I think, what, a, a big reason why we are all here. So I'm just going to walk through a few user stories. The first one is the, the classic crypto-to-crypto peer-to-peer payment. Satoshi wants to send Bitcoin to Vitalik, who wants to receive Ethereum. I think we all know why. This is a pretty classic case, right? Now, if Satoshi wanted to send, like, someone else Bitcoin and they want to receive Bitcoin, that's great. There's a network for that. And uh, he created it. Um, <laughs> but it gets a little complex, right? And we all know, and, and Evan talked about a little bit of tribalism, when you try to pay another tribe, they get a little upset or like, you know, they don't necessarily want to accept your, your you know, altcoin or whatever term they call it. So this is like a classic case, right? And it's, and it's pretty simple. And it's, and it, you know, I think that uh, ILP can actually do a really uh, uh, good job actually solving this. The Kava team demonstrated, you know, a way to possibly solve this using more of a, of a swap. And I think this is a, a, this is a really interesting user story. In the crypto to fiat realm, Vitalik wants to send ETH to Stefan, who is like, forget this crypto stuff, I just want to receive dollars. <laughs> he's CEO now, so he's you know, thinking dollars. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, Vitalik, come on, give me some dollars, right? And this is like the crypto to fiat case, right? And this is, this is uh, once you go fiat, you know, things get really complicated. So... This is another potential you know, use case that, that ILP can solve. This is the, the fiat to fiat, domestic, we call it a domestic use case, where Stefan actually wants to pay Ben because Ben's always working really hard. And, uh, and Ben, it turns out, wants to receive dollars too because uh, his rent isn't collected in crypto. And you know, this is a classic fiat to fiat. This is like, you know, a pretty solvable thing. It's not too hard to send dollars from person to person if I'm sending, you know, as long as like Stefan has Venmo and Ben has Venmo, it's good. But the minute like Stefan has Venmo and Ben has PayPal, all hell breaks loose, right? Like who's going to join whose network? What's going to happen? Like this is like this happens all the time. Anytime I go on a trip with people and we try to like, you know, cost share, it's always like, oh, pay me in Square Cash. No, pay me in Venmo. No, pay me. It's just like it's a mess. So I think in the you know in the in the somewhat med medium to, uh, to uh, medium stage future, I think that ILP can actually really really solve this particular case where you're taking these siloed networks and you start combining them into a, a single interoperable. Protocol. This one's a little more complex, and this is this is really the the, the problem that Ripple has been tackling for a while. Um, so Ben wants to send U.S. dollars to Taiga, who's sitting right next to him, but Taiga accepts Japanese yen, right? And how do we actually do that conversion? It's believe it or not a, a big pain. Working at Ripple, we've been working on this problem for a long time, and it is a really really hard problem. I think the ILP will continue to evolve to solve this problem. Um, but I think it's, again, it's like one of those use cases the, to kind of summarize in the crypto to crypto, fiat to crypto, and fiat to fiat. I think that the big focus should be on crypto to crypto, at least in the initial stages, because it just works. Like, it, you know, it, we, we have all the tools, it's programmable, we can fire up stuff, we don't have to go work with banks, we don't have to work with financial institutions, we to, we, it just works. So uh, kind of in terms like near-term use cases, I really think the crypto-to-crypto, payment-to-payment, peer-to-peer is, is a kind of a killer use case. Another one's cur currency exchange. So currency exchange is really expensive. Uh, it requires users to give up custody and privacy in order to participate in this global economy. And you know, that's coming at a higher, higher cost. Um, 
and just there's a lot of friction to actually do currency exchange. Back in the day, you had to go to a currency exchange at the airport and swap it out. There's currency exchange, you know, and it takes a while to actually get your funds. Um, so I put myself on the spot here. Uh, in the crypto crypto case, again, um, no surprise. So I want to send Bitcoin in order to receive Ethereum. So like Ethereum pre-sale, they were selling Ethereum and you had to deposit Bitcoin. And I had to send that to an address that was custodied by someone and with the promise of basically an IOU that I'm gonna get Ethereum at some point. Luckily it showed up, but that was kind of the classic case. A lot of friction in that kind of, in that case. And I think that ILP can really help solve a lot of that. In the fiat to crypto kind of case, like, uh, you know, this, oh, this cool new uh, currency comes out called XRP, and I'm like, yeah, I want to go buy it. Uh, so I take my U.S. dollars, I onboard at an exchange, I do the KYC, takes me a while to get approved, then I got to wire the money in there, and then finally I'm in a position where I, I buy the XRP, but it costs me, you know, a, a fairly decent fee. That's a lot of friction. Um, I think this is something that, that LP can really help solve and kind of reduce some of that friction. In the whole crypto to fiat kind of similar story, right? Ethereum's tanking and I'm like, want to get out and like, I want to sell. So I, I do the opposite. I transfer it into, <clears throat> into my bank. They say you haven't been in crypto long enough until you actually get a bank account to like cancel your bank or cancel your, uh, either turn around a, a transaction or shut down your account because it, it happens, you know, some of the financial institutions don't really, aren't keen on, on banking uh, crypto. So this is a big friction point. And then the classic case, fiat to fiat, you know, I use the, the cross border, you know, I wanna send US dollars and convert it to Mexican peso. I'm going on vacation, I'm gonna go spend, you know, some time down there and I don't wanna like rack up uh, transaction fees in my card. I just wanna pay cash, I just want cash. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to kind of convert and it's, it's a lot of friction. So again, summary, no surprise. Um, kind of here is, is really, I think, where the sweet spot is the crypto to crypto use case uh, to really start driving that liquidity flywheel. So the next one is e-commerce. So e-commerce e companies, and, and there's a few in, sitting in here actually, are, are facing a growing number of payment options to accept, which this is really increasing a lot of friction and cost. Um, so how do, how does an e-commerce company be able to accept payments from anyone, anywhere, any currency, doesn't matter, without having to like support all these different payment types and plugins and, and everything. It's, it's, it's really a, a, a difficult process. In this story, uh, you know, Brandon wants to send XRP to fund a Codius host in order to run an ILP connector. Like this is like a kind of a near term case, right? You could basically do this today. Um, it's, it's here and now, it hits home. This is a use case that we can, we can do. Let's do it tomorrow. Um, in the same sense, you know, Danny wants to send Bitcoin uh, to fund an Ethereum smart contract in order to buy more crypto kitties because Danny loves crypto kitties, and Danny's not here, and I can say that. He left early. In this case, you know, you have, you know, you're, you're basically, you're funding, you know, one crypto to another system. You're doing that cross-chain transaction. I think this is a really uh, solid sweet spot that we can really focus on for the next coming, you know, into the coming months. In the crypto to fiat kind of case, Sunit wants to send Bitcoin to a merchant in, in JPY, and in order to buy more matcha tea. I don't know if Sunit's still here, but he loves matcha tea. In this case, you know, there's, you're going from a crypto to a fiat and it's cross-border. It's a little complex, but that merchant, you know, is basically wants to get paid in, in Japanese yen, uh, but Sunit is, insists on paying it in Bitcoin. So that's a friction point I think that, that uh, ILP can really help solve eventually. So Ethan wants to send US dollars to a merchant in Euro. This is a classic fiat to fiat. You're seeing a pattern here. I hope it's resonating uh, in order to buy concert tickets. Again, fiat to fiat cross borders a really, really difficult problem. But I think eventually, you know, um, when the liquidity kind of starts to build, we can, we can start to focus on that. So same summary, you know, I think that we're really focused on the crypto to crypto use case. Um, and then we can, as we kind of build, we can start to expand it to include more fiat use cases. 
um, but the network still has to be, you know, e Ethan mentioned this morning, you know, uh, Spring Team has, has a goal to have a thousand nodes in the network by the end of 2019. That sounds like a lofty goal, but I think we can make it work. Um, it's kind of, it's gonna, it's gonna take a huge effort. Uh, the Spring Team is definitely focused. Things we like to hear, it just works. And think like that's something that should resonate in everyone's head. Like just make it work, right? It just it doesn't have to be really shiny. It doesn't have. It just has to work, and then consistently work. And I think that that will continue to increase uh, the, the actual experience for newcomers, and people will start start to actually come back and, and continue to build. Spring team also likes uh, we like full stack. So I think when you build a full stack application. It, something interesting happens, a, a network starts to coalesce around it, right? You can point to a lot of early internet full stack companies where a bunch of developer tools and things were built around it, but that was kind of like the, the, the island in the middle of the ocean that you know everyone, everyone could kind of rally around. So we're definitely into full stack, definitely in the crypto to crypto use cases, peer to peer, currency, exchange, and e-commerce. And if you want to hear future use cases, I'm sure Stefan has a lot for us tomorrow to talk about the future of ILP. Any questions? Um, I'm curious how or, and if you account for like taxes in some of these use cases, like especially if you're talking about micropayments where you might have to figure out how to pay taxes on each of those. Or, I don't know. How, how do you account for that? Again, like it's if, if, you're, if you're operating a full stack, application you have the benefit of being able to make that a good consumer experience so that's that would be part of a solution that you would have to build in to to the application that's why i think these things like they really have to be full stack at first um you know some really core full stack applications that can address you know tax um, where you're pulling time and and and, and everything and um and an amount, I think that the full SAP applications are gonna have to eventually account for that. Are you for completely getting rid of fiat forever? And uh, if yes, where do you see, uh, like how do you break out the cycle? There's, there's a cycle right now, the friction is super high, right? Whenever we wanna develop anything, fiat's still needed, and uh, it's a challenge, right? You gotta work with custodians, it's a lot of work. Um, where do you see, how do you see Interledger helping the industry break out of that vicious cycle of fear? Um, vicious, uh, so the question is, uh, how do I, to summarize, how do you get, um, how does Interledger help break the, uh, yeah, the cycle, so the cycle out of, of like, of like fiat? Yes, so, so I get paid in dollars, yep. I go pay merchants in dollars. Mm -hmm. And then if I want crypto, I have to move my money somewhere, mm -hmm. in exchange, get crypto, and then be able to go do stuff with those assets somewhere. I, I don't want to go through all that. Right? I want to get paid, basically, or, or have initially my salary. And, uh, so I think, I think it's, so again, uh, so breaking out of like the vicious cycle of, of fiat, the conversion, the friction between fiat and crypto, you know, I think that eventually, like, if, if we can nail the kind of crypto to crypto use case, uh, which still there's still friction in crypto to crypto, even though it's programmable, programmable money. Like it, it, there shouldn't be so much friction. There is, if we can nail that and, and really solve and make cross chain transactions simple. Um, you know, it's very similar to what Kava built. Like you, you, you humanize the experience. It's not like the user doesn't need to know that they're opening or closing a payment channel. It's just a card. Like. That's that's a type of user experience that that should be you know introduced so that people don't have to think about payment channels so they don't have to think about those types of things. Um, we'll think about those and you know Stefan said like everyone in the, in the audience was like clapping really hard because we know how hard it is to abstract all that stuff away to make it super simple. So I think if there's enough full stack applications that do that, then eventually that will blend into the fiat world. The fiat world will start to adopt. You know, interledger and and the way that Spring's kind of approaching it is both kind of a top down and bottom up approach. Uh, so, but again, the fiat world moves slow. Like the applications in the fiat world are massive; they've got a lot of priorities. Uh, crypto moves much faster. The the companies building on them, they're they're faster to move. So, 
we can work with those companies to help kind of drive adoption. I'm just wondering about where point of sale fits in at all, like the retail aspect. Is, is retail figuring in the plans? Does that come under P2P or is that entirely? It would probably fall under the e-commerce case. You know, uh, you could really kind of, even though it's it's an entirely different experience going on e-commerce site and, and shopping and in retail, but we're starting to see a blend where you, you have some of the online e-commerce shops that are also running similar software or the same software in their actually point, point of sale system. Uh, Square is like a big, uh, big player in both spaces. So I do see, you know, adoption. I think it's harder, though, again, in the physical point of sale because you work, you're, you're working against the card networks and the cash and, and all that other stuff where in e-commerce, you're just talking about digital payments. So it's, it's a little bit lower hanging fruit. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm still trying to formulate it in my mind, but it, it revolves around you know, somebody that, that has an ILP connector and uh, Cody is hosting and XRPL nodes and all of that. I guess the thing that I'm concerned about when it comes to sizing up ILP uh, connector is how that fits into financial uh, regulations, and, you know, like, am I needing to have a money uh, service business license, uh, financial license? I mean, so the the question was about ILP con connectors and like um, how to compliance compliance of ILP connectors. So I'm actually uh, leading a discussion tomorrow about the ILP connector experience. Um, Strata team also like, had an awesome demonstration today of the package, but I'm not going to get into the compliance and legal aspect because, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a regulatory special, uh, but uh, I do want to talk about the experience generally about like running a connector and, and how we can collectively work together and improve it. So, all right, thanks a lot.